So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts in Beekeeping. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Bee. I keep honeybees in various hive configurations here in my own apiary. Two hive designs have features that remove the need to lift heavy boxes. I'm talking about horizontal hives, the long lang and lay-ins specifically. My guest today is a household name regarding keeping bees with a smile in horizontal hives. It's Dr. Leo Sharashkin. He's the editor of Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives and Keeping Bees with a Smile, and he's a regular contributor to American Bee Journal and Bee Culture magazines, among other publications. He lives in a forest homestead in the Ozarks in southern Missouri. He catches wild swarms and he raises bees naturally. Dr. Leo speaks internationally on sustainable beekeeping and organic growing. He holds a PhD in forestry from the University of Missouri. Here's Dr. Leo. Hi, my name is Dr. Leo Sharashkin, and I'm a full-time natural beekeeper uh, living in the Ozarks of Southern Missouri. And I'm uh, the founder of HorizontalHive.com, which is uh, a resource on keeping bees in horizontal hives and uh, has a lot of advice on doing it naturally with no chemical treatments and with no sugar feeding. And uh, uh, we only catch wild swarms in the Ozarks and uh, keep them in these easy to build horizontal hives. Uh, on the website, you will find their free plans uh, for building your own box. And also we offer supplies like what you see in the back, if you'd rather buy yourself a swarm trap and a horizontal hive to get started. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate that you agreed to interview with me here on Zoom. And uh, a lot of my viewers are already familiar with you. Most of them are backyard beekeepers, keeping bees basically for their own pleasure overall. So I think that fits nicely with your philosophies and uh, the way that you're managing bees there. We already held up books in the beginning, and these are books that I refer to a lot. And you had, uh, you were an editor, I believe, for the- That's correct. Keeping Bees with a Smile. And for those that are looking into horizontal beekeeping, of course, this is the other book. And there's links uh, to Dr. Leo's website that will be down in the video description. And also links, if you're listening to this on podcast, if you look at the information underneath, those links will be there also. So you can see exactly what goes on on the website. But I want to go beyond the website. So now we have Dr. Leo. Where did you grow up? Like, when did you first? get involved with bees? Because I don't think it happened when you came to Missouri. No, I, I grew up uh, in Russia and my uncle is a beekeeper. He, uh, he's been keeping bees since 1972, mm -hmm. since before I was even born. And I was spending um, summers in the village where he had his bees about 200 miles east of Moscow. And this was my first introduction to beekeeping. He had both vertical hives and horizontal hives. Mm -hmm. And there is one thing I noticed that the older he was getting, the fewer vertical hives there were left. And now he is turning 83 this year. He still keeps bees, but by now only horizontal hives are left in his apiary because that's something that he can comfortably work with uh, in, uh, in his age. Mm -hmm. So then, he was the beekeeper. How old were you when you first went in the bee yard and thought that this was something really interesting for you personally? Well, that's because we were eating all of the wonderful honey that he was getting out of the uh, of these mm -hmm. boxes. Uh, as with any child, uh, I think most of the attraction initially was the honey rather than the bees themselves. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, overcoming the fear of getting stung and putting the veil and being by the side of my uncle when I was probably five or six is my first memory of interacting with the bees. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw that they're not really stinging, um, I think from that point onward, there wasn't much fear left there and I was helping a little bit. Uh, he was preferring to do everything himself mm -hmm. um, because uh, he wanted to make sure that everything is done the way he is doing it. But as an observer, I was around the bees since uh, practically as far back as I can remember. So would you say that was a rural location or was he near? Yeah, a city? that's a village uh, in the middle of nowhere. 
And you know, that's the wonderful memories of childhood. It's not just about the bees, it's how simple living was back there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a log cabin uh, with uh, gray walls that were not painted there. There was no um, running water. There was no uh, restroom. You go to the outhouse outside. If you need water, you go and you lower a bucket into a well and then bring it up um, bucket by bucket. Um, the nearest bus stop was five miles away to go to town. So you walk five miles, you get on the bus, and then you go into town and back. And they're uh, very peaceful, lots of birds and wildlife in the clear spring and their uh, river to, um, to uh, swim in. And the forests were full of the wild swarms. This is how my uncle was getting his stock. Mm -hmm. He would put up a small hive, send it with their um, citrusy um, smell and some uh, mint smell uh, on the tree in the springtime, and the swarms would just move in. I, I very clearly remember that too, because it was fascinating to see a box hanging on an apple tree, and all of a sudden there is this big beard of our honeybees landing on it and then walking in. So, you know, I still miss this kind of experience because our to me, this memory of the childhood is uh, the kind of the world that we are losing, not just with the bees when everything is simple and chemical free, but also with the lifestyle when everything is so fast. Uh, most people have no more time just to stand back and look at everything and admire the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, did you live in a multi-generational home or did your family live separate from your uncle? How was that set up? Uh, my family lived separate, but uh, what most families do back in Russia is uh, uh, the grandparents getting old, you take them uh, with you, with the family. So they live with you uh, instead of going to retirement home. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there were one, two, three, four generations living in our apartment. Uh, my parents and my brother and also my grandmother uh, my mother's mom and my great grandmother, uh, my father's grandmother. So we all live together. And yeah. she, uh, my great grandmother uh, was born in 1898 and she lived to be 98 years old. So listening to her stories was fascinating because she was born before the Bolshevik Revolution. Mm -hmm. She outlived the, uh, the Civil War, two world wars. Uh, so she was born before Soviet Union even existed, and she died after the Soviet Union disintegrated and died. Uh, wow. And she saw with her own eyes, she saw the last czar, Nicholas II. She saw Rasputin. She saw Lenin and Stalin and all the Soviet leaders all the way to Gorbachev. And this is just one lifetime. And, you know, the stories you hear in the family is not something you can ever read anywhere mm -hmm. because she would tell me how an emerald or diamond ring or earrings uh, equaled one loaf of bread after the revolution when people were just selling all their belongings mm -hmm. just to feed their children and to survive. Wow, I can't tell you how glad I am that I even asked that question because this is this is a vision. This is you know, this is not what's in people's minds when they think about Russia or the landscape or how people might be living there. So this is really interesting. And I wonder if, because if you grow up uh, having access to nature and a simple life without distractions and things like that, do you think that makes you more keen when you're looking at nature and observing things like bees? I don't know, Fred, because different people probably have different inclinations. Or many people in these villages, they grew up there in the middle of the woods or in the fields but they were looking forward to moving into the town. <laughs> and uh, the problems with the Russian countryside, even when I was growing up, was that all of these villages were dying out. The younger generation attracted by uh, job opportunities and city life were all leaving, mm -hmm. and the, young, the older generation was dying off. So the village that probably had 25 uh, homes only had their two or three that were uh, inhabited year round. 
Others were used by people who now lived in the city and only came there for uh, for the summer, like a vacation house. Mm -hmm. So no, I cannot say that it was just because of this introduction to this experience that I developed interest in bees and all things natural. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly it contributed to that in my particular case, mm -hmm. because from the very early age, I was preferring going into the woods or uh, swimming in the creek to sitting and watching cartoons on the uh, on the mm -hmm. TV. And were you by yourself or did you have friends or yeah. siblings? Yeah, in the in summer in this village, no friends, just me. My parents would live there with my uncle and his family. Mm -hmm. And my uncle was a dentist. So most of the time he was in town working and would only come there over the weekend. So for the most part, during these summers, I was left to myself to go into the woods and pick blueberries and swim in the creek and hmm. uh, catch uh, crawfish and uh, um, watch the bees and uh, weed the garden and uh, carry water, uh, maybe chop some firewood when I was getting older. But these chores that are um, maybe meaningless to people who do it all the time but for mm -hmm. me as someone who was spending the rest of the year in the city i was born and raised or, or raised in the suburbs of moscow mm -hmm. um, this was literally a gulp of fresh air mm -hmm. that's really interesting too were there any animals in the environment out there that would have been dangerous to you like is there something I guess you so. to... there were moose there uh in uh, in the forest there um i never saw bears um, but uh, it looks like there were a few around, but uh, no, I don't think there was something very dangerous. I think just as here in the Ozarks, the most dangerous uh, agent in the environment were ticks and the infections that the ticks were carrying. Hmm. But back in this time of the Soviet Union, they were actually spraying the forest from uh, um, air airplanes to kill ticks. Hmm. Um, so I don't remember receiving many tick bites or there in the woods wandering through. Hmm. Uh, but uh, that's certainly not the case here in the Ozarks. I'm happy nobody is spraying the Ozark wilderness yeah. against ticks. But uh, I always tell people, if you do uh, any work outside, uh, including beekeeping, you need to be checking yourself and your children daily. Because just as bees are suffering from varroa mites, uh, I have heard so many stories of people crippled by infections transmitted by um, a deer ticks attached to us. Right. And they get, of course, Lyme disease is the big concern. Yes. Um, so now I have to ask the bees that were there. We have uh, the bees here that are the Russian line. Did they look like that? Were they dark? What uh, were no, they? people what? don't realize that the word Russian bee, it's not the uh, bee that's used in Siberia or in Northern European Russia. The derivations are of what's called the Russian bee is actually much farther south, almost Greece and Balkans and Ukraine. Hmm. It was taken to the far east or across from Japan on the Russian side of the far east. And this is where it was kept for a hundred years before hmm. it was introduced into the United States. So the bees that people use in the west of Russia uh, is a mixture of everything. The indigenous bee there is the European dark bee, which is very dark with uh, almost no yellow striping, a little bit of gray striping, but mm. very, very dark. Around here, people call it the black bee. And of course, many people buy commercial packages populated with carniolan bees or Italian bees or mm -hmm. um, gray caucasus bees. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle uh, relied on the local swarms that looked quite dark. But once in a while, it would be just the yellow striped Italian honeybee because somebody lost a swarm from their hive in the nearby village. Mm -hmm. Now, what was one method that your uncle might have had when he attended to his bees that now with all of your experience looking back, uh, do you still agree with the things that he was doing back then? Or have you learned some things that you could have taught him maybe something new? No, I don't think I could, uh, you know, teach him anything new. Um, he's been doing it for more than 50 years now. Mm -hmm. And his methods were very, very simple. Um, what attracted me to horizontal hives is that um, you don't need to go into the hives or on a regular basis. It's not every week or every two weeks. 
So mm -hmm. I remember him filling the horizontal hives with frames in May, and we were not touching them until uh, late August when the time came to harvest honey from them. Mm -hmm. Um, I would guess that my most powerful memory of our uh, childhood and something that I tried to recreate for my children when we started keeping bees here in the Ozarks uh, is uh, the, because the colonies were not treated with anything. And of course, back when I was growing up, it was not necessary because the Varomites were not around yet. But because they were not treated with chemicals, the comb that spent time in the brew chamber was edible. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that's where bees are put all of that bee bread, the fermented pollen uh, that they use for feeding the brood. And they're eating this uh, very dark comb full of bee bread uh, is one of the most uh, vivid uh, memories of the childhood. So when I was uh, uh, starting beekeeping in the Ozarks after we bought the farm in 2008, and after I graduated from the University of Missouri with my doctorate in forestry, um, I started managing my beehives to produce a lot of this bee bread honey, first for my children and for our own consumption. And eventually we started offering it as a variety of the honey we sell. Mm -hmm. And even though that's the most expensive one I produce, this is the first one to uh, sell out. Hmm. And I did look at your website. So those that are watching this uh, can go to the same link and there is honey for sale there. And the honey that's being described now is listed there also. At what, uh, what time in your life did you decide that coming to the United States was uh, going to be something you wanted to do? And, and when did you do it? Yeah, I just uh, first came for my master's degree for two years. It was not, uh, I, I was not planning to live here permanently. After I got my college degree in international economics, I received the scholarship to come to Indiana University Bloomington for two years and, and get ma master's in natural resources management. So that was my first time coming to the US in 1999 through 2001. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of my program, I also did uh, um, one and a half months, one summer, and then three more months the following summer in Hawaii in their Department of Forestry as an intern. Mm -hmm. This was a fascinating internship. And in 2001, we packed and we went back to Russia and I uh, worked there at World Wildlife Fund, WWF, as a project manager. Oh. But our dream was always to own some acreage, not just to live in the city or in the suburbs, but to have a farm, maybe even a small farm. But that was the greatest challenge back then, because uh, during the Soviet time, all the land belonged to the government. You were not allowed to privately own even a few acres. And uh, even though the laws changed uh, um, in their late 1999, et cetera, so even though the laws changed, the attitudes were still the same. We ended up buying five acres and we wanted to have our homestead outside the city, but there were so many restrictions. Uh, you were not allowed even to build your own house on agricultural land without rezoning it into residential instead of agricultural, et cetera. And, uh, and then after a few years uh, I, of office work, by the way, you know, working in a conservation nonprofit was less satisfying than I thought it would be because yes, I was uh, involved in conservation projects, but my day-to-day -day work was all about office job, uh, mm -hmm. paperwork, computers, meetings there. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I need to get a job that would get me outside. And I looked at what uh, would fit into my previous training and I would, what I would like to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I realized that forestry would be the area I would very much like to get further education, mm -hmm. education in. So I applied to a number of our schools and got admitted in four of them and picked the University of Missouri in Columbia because it had the strongest agroforestry program. This is how you can integrate trees into agricultural landscapes to make uh, it all more sustainable. Hmm. So I spent five years there. And after that, uh, uh, we decided to stay. Hmm. That's great. 
And that, uh, yeah, Columbia is University of Missouri. It's also known as Mizzou. I have a lot of friends that went there. So my, uh, my stepfather was at St. Louis University in St. Louis. I'm from Kirkwood. So it's the first suburb west of the Mississippi. And I know exactly where you went to school. And also the Ozarks, we kind of avoided that area because it was pretty, it was pretty backwoods. And so it still so, is. So how did you, and you have 600 acres there, correct? Yeah, well, it all started with the 80 acres that we originally bought. Yeah. But, you know, the greatest uh, uh, disappointment of living in the Ozarks was seeing the tremendous amount of deforestation and logging going on. Mm -hmm. And I have a degree in forestry, so I know that forests can be used responsibly and you can log them responsibly without destroying the whole ecosystem, but it's not what you see happening around here. Mm -hmm. uh, people, for the most part, see it as a one-time deal uh, instead of taking the long-term approach and managing the forest sustainably, making selective cuts. When you go into the woods and after five years, you don't even see that any trees were taken out. Um, when logging is done here, it's like they dropped a nuclear bomb and uh, even locals who grew up here, so they're so sorry to see all of this landscape bulldozed down mm -hmm. and to be converted from the forest into pasture and grazing. Mm -hmm. That uh, um, I felt that if uh, we moved here because of the beauty of this part of the country and because of the trees and the clear streams, I needed to contribute something to saving it. So as a family, we decided that instead of uh, saving for retirement or having savings, we would uh, put everything we make and all the profits from HorizontalHive.com, from my teaching, from my honey sales, uh, we put everything into acquiring more land. Uh, when the farm next door came on the market a few years ago, by that time, I had already paid off mortgage on the home. And I thought I would never borrow from a bank again because it felt great to have no mortgage bills to worry about. Mm -hmm. But then when I knew that this farm was for sale and that if we didn't make an offer, it would be bulldozed down. Um, more than half of the, uh, this additional acreage was forested with big trees that it takes two people to hug. So I knew it would be instantly logged out and destroyed. Hmm. And we went ahead and we borrowed from the bank and we purchased that. And, uh, and it never felt as good to borrow money and uh, get mortgage bills again, because now it was meaningful. We knew that we're conserving the kind of the world we wanted to live for our children. And then another farm came on the market. So gradually we increased our holdings from uh, 80 acres to now actually more than 1,000 acres. Not oh. all of it has been paid for, uh, but uh, half of it has already been paid for. And uh, I hope my children choose to continue doing what I'm doing, not necessarily being beekeepers, but at least keeping this land wild instead of selling it for development or to a logger. And you know, one, one other reason why we moved in this direction is that after graduating from Mizu and moving to the Ozarks, uh, I was doing a forestry consultancy work. And I clearly saw that from the economic standpoint in the Ozarks, leaving the land wild and putting some beehives there to take advantage of some of the amazing wilderness plants we have here. Like for example, lots of blue, um, blackberries and sumacs. This was the most economically profitable way of uh, managing the land. It produces very clean honey that's away from agriculture, no pesticide. And uh, also it keeps the wilderness wild for other forms of life to persist. Um, so it made it twice as painful to see all of this destruction going on mm -hmm. around, understanding that people are shooting themselves in the foot when they're bulldozing 120 acres of sumac brush that could produce amazing harvests of honey mm -hmm. and put cattle in there. Well, with running cattle, because the soil here is so uh, rocky and so shallow and summers are so hot and dry, uh, you won't be able to make even interest payments on the purchase of the farm if you relied on beef production. Hmm. 
That is really interesting. And I want to back up a little bit. You mentioned these trees that you couldn't even get your arm around. Um, some areas have protections against logging these large old growth trees. Are there no protections like that in that part of Missouri? No, and not only there are no protections there um, uh, for preventing these big trees from disappearing. Um, unfortunately, there are also no restrictions on subdividing the land. Mm. In the last two years, with many people wanting to have a, a small acreage in the country, and not necessarily living there, but just as a backup. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it created huge demand for small, like five acre plots. And this is when most of the logging started happening on a vast scale. You know, some of my best swarm catching areas where I would, um, where I would put the swarm traps like this one in the background. Mm -hmm. And for every two swarm traps, I would set out on trees. One would have a swarm. Um, 10 years ago or five years ago, now it's changing very rapidly and the number of swarms I'm catching um, declined substantially because all of the forest and the beet trees with that forest have been wiped out. So mm -hmm. not only there are no restrictions on logging and cutting down these big trees, you know, I was crying when we closed on that piece of land recently that has an oak tree that it took three people, three adults to put your arms around, three people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it gives you, you know, a perspective of what kind of forest used to be here. Mm -hmm. So uh, anything 12 inches or larger here for oak is considered marketable timber. So when they cut down 12 inch diameter trees, and you know that a uh, hundred years ago, trees were 60 inches in diameter, even more, then you start realizing how much was lost and we are just doing you know as much as we can trying to preserve it uh, uh, with these big trees and preventing it being broken down into these small plots of land uh, and they're sold for development hmm. and what happened to the the buildings like the farmhouses the barns and things that were associated with the farms that you purchased Oh, uh, after the, the World War II, most people moved to the cities and there are um, some of the farms that I buy, you call it a farm, but there are no more structures. You may see a foundation oh. with 50 year old uh, pine trees growing through the foundation. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So many of these were abandoned either during uh, the years after World War II or in subsequent decades, but many of these acreages were passed down in the family and the younger generation living somewhere in Chicago or elsewhere kept the land, mm -hmm. but they never really lived there. Maybe they were coming to hunt in the fall, mm -hmm. but much of the land has already started going back to the natural succession. That's why there is so much blackberry and sumac growth are on these old fields that mm -hmm. start reverting to nature. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the problem you described uh, even in Russia where you know, the family farms, the, the kids didn't want to stay on the farm and probably didn't learn to farm and said they go to the cities. That exact same thing happens right here. I live on a dirt road. Uh, we have eight family dairy farms here and we're down to one. And the answer is the same. Uh, it used to be you had a bunch of kids and they would work the farm and the farm would grow and the kids would get their part of the farm and that would grow. And, but now none of the kids want to stick around. And these are very profitable family farms. But as the couples age, they end up having to sell them off. And now they've gone from dairy uh, to crop farms because mm -hmm. one person can own all the farms now, which is kind of what's happening. In fact, the last, we have one dairy farm left. Um, so yeah, it's changing a lot. And so now we have crops everywhere instead of cattle in the fields. And Fred, I have two comments in this regard. First, this is not just happening where you live or where right. I live. I translated this book from French. It's called Honey from the Earth. It's an amazing huge volume that takes you on a, a trip around the world and shows you how bees are kept in 23 different countries. Mm -hmm. And it even shows are these honey hunters that, uh, that climb the cliffs in India and Nepal and get honey from these wild bees there. And exactly the same challenge is what they are facing. The younger generation 
is no longer interested in risking their life and getting there on this bamboo rope or, or ladder on the cliffs to get some honey from the bees mm -hmm. because they can buy candy even in their village store in the mountains in Nepal these days. Yeah. Yeah. So other sources of sweets. Yeah. And, and you have another book that's uh, listed on your website called The Being. Yeah, that's my most recent uh, uh, translation project. You know, yeah. when I come across a book written or published in another language and it's so great and it's not available in English, I cannot uh, uh, keep myself from uh, wanting to make it available. This is what happened with Keeping Bees with a Smile, which I first uh, saw in Russian and it is the best resource on natural beekeeping. Mm -hmm. And then Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives um, is the French book. It's mm -hmm. actually more than 100 years old now, but the messages in there are amazingly relevant today. For example, in his time, people were just starting using non-local bees, for example, taking Italian bees and propagating them everywhere, including in climates which are very different from the Mediterranean um, uh, climate where the bee originated. So lands 100 years ago already had the message do not work with anything other than locally adapted stock of local bees. Anyway, so um, when I came across this book, which is produced by the same um, photographer as Honey from the Earth, he spent many, many years going inside the hive and taking macro pictures you won't find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And another author is Jurgen Tauts. Many of your listeners probably know his book, The Buzz About Bees. This mm -hmm. is the German researcher uh, who contributed the text to the book. So this is a coffee table size book, uh, which is uh, visually stunning, but also very informative, uh, presenting the cutting edge newest information on honeybee biology. Mm -hmm. And it's great. I actually ordered mine. As soon as you agreed to interview with me, I found that book and ordered it, but it's not going to get here till Monday. So I, I can't show off my copy, but... Uh, but I'll definitely be reviewing that because I agree. It's, it's visually alone, just the detail. I'm a photographer, so I really appreciate the approach to image making and everything else. So hopefully people will look at that one too. And let's move along here. Uh, so now you're in Missouri. Now you set up your B and you do workshops and everything else. And uh, I did see a thing on Mother Earth News, by the way, and it had a horizontal hive and it had a modified lid on it so that someone could lay down inside on top of the hive was that associated with your article about the health yeah actually beekeeping? there was my article in uh, american bee journal too called okay. sleeping with the bees yeah in eastern europe uh including poland and uh, ukraine russia there is a growing trend of making what's called a bee bed basically it's a long horizontal hive uh, but you it's long enough for you to lie down on. So if you go to horizontalhive.com, you will see under the plans section, okay. the um, plans for building your own bee bed for the Langstroth frames um, and for the European lens frames that I am using. And it's an amazing, uh, uh, relaxing experience. Um, people who have never tried it have no idea what uh, uh, soothing, influence it, uh, it has mm -hmm. because uh, four strong colonies in these hives under you in the summer generate so much heat that uh, it's enough to break a sweat like in a sauna hmm. then uh, all of that buzzing allows you to sleep and of course all of the smells there is a sp special passages so that when the bees evaporate nectar instead of going just outside all of this air is captured and channeled into the small enclosure above this bee bed where you are sleeping. Mm -hmm. So the air is saturated with fragrances of the flowers that the bees evaporate into mm -hmm. honey. And finally, and this was for me, when I built one, um, the most amazing thing to experience, uh, bees obviously evaporate nectar by fanning their wings. Mm -hmm. And when you have four strong beehives that you lie uh, over, uh, there is uh, so much vibration from the fanning of the wings that you can palpably feel a little bit of the shaking of these boxes. Mm -hmm. So receive a, a massage at the same time. 
Um, so, you know, everything I've been doing in beekeeping was uh, to, to do something that's pleasurable mm -hmm. and that gives you a smile. So building a bee bed, this horizontal hive that you can sleep in is one of these essential pleasures. And, you know, many people use it for therapy too. I don't make any yeah. medicinal claims about that, but there are even visitors who slept in our bee bed uh, reported like one lady who was suffering from headaches mm -hmm. uh, regularly and debilitating mm -hmm. headaches, um, almost got cured for six months. She mm -hmm. even was able to get off medications mm -hmm. for six months after spending a couple of hours in this bee bed. Um, and again, yeah, you can go to her on horizontalhive.com and see the plans and some mm -hmm. of the background about mm -hmm. it. I'm actually very interested in that because, and I'm also glad that you said that it wasn't currently, there are no published papers supporting the health benefits. Um, yet, there are so many people providing a testimony like you just talked about. Um, I get emails from people a lot and uh, that talk about things that they don't want discussed on my Q&As or things like that. But it was uh, similar to that, to where he has respiratory issues. And they built a special mask for him. He talked his doctor into selling him a respiratory therapy mask, I guess maybe, I don't know what they call them, PAPs or I don't know what it is, but the tube mm -hmm. went into the beehive and he had uh, marked improvement in his respiratory distress. And when he was explaining to the doctor what was going on, it's very hard to quantify um, exactly what it is that's making him feel better. Uh, but the physician could validate that he was improving, that his lung function was improving because he could do pulmonary tests and things like that. And it was this beehive experience. And so when I saw the bed uh, article, I just, is there, how could we evaluate whether or not and how that's helping people, uh, especially those with, um, breathing issues and things like that yeah you know i'm seeing that the people who are most beneficially affected are people with respiratory mm -hmm. issues and then anything related to the nerves like depression and nervous breakdown overwork stress insomnia and it makes sense because if it is a very relaxing experience it mm -hmm. would have a um, very positive influence on people's uh, state of well-being and also muscles and joints, because it's such a deep relaxation with all of this vibration and the mm. heat um, that are, uh, many people report the improvement to of like spasm and muscles, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I don't know about quantifying it, but uh, you know, I don't want to wait for the science to quantify something that I can experience straight away right, right. here yeah. and draw conclusions myself. For mm. example, you know, uh, I have so much training in science. I have a doctorate, right? But I know there are so many limitations on all of this statistical analysis mm -hmm. because you and your organism, you can know better what's good for you than uh, any doctors or uh, you know nutritionists, et cetera. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we first came to the United States in 1999 for my master's program, uh, we were not aware of uh, hormones used there in dairy production because this was not something that was done in the Soviet Union and then Russia at the time. Um, so all of these growth hormones, they were just not being used in dairy. And uh, we come to the America and all of a sudden we start gaining weight like tremendously, like swelling day by day, week by week, changing sizes. So all the clothes that we brought from Russia, two months later, we couldn't fit in, both my wife and myself. And we started talking and there, um, we see that other students from Eastern Europe who came at the same time as us, they also start swelling and just becoming a beast before our very eyes. Anyway, so we discovered talking to different people that it may be because of the growth hormones are in the dairy hmm. and we excluded dairy um, and only started eating organic dairy and the problem gradually went away. So after two more months of excluding dairy, um, we were back to normal. Uh, even though at the same time, all of these packages were carrying the statement, 
According to FDA, there is no difference in milk from uh, hormone treated there cows and non-hormone treated mm. uh, cows. And right there, I knew that no matter what uh, the research uh, and the agencies responsible for the safety of food are, um, are stating, uh, you and your body can uh, know better than anybody else what's good mm. for you or not. So for me, it was one of the relations that amazingly in this very opulent country, the quality of food that most people eat and that's widely available in supermarkets is not necessarily that's healthy or that would be good for you. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes me back to what struck you um, the most when you came to the United States? Did you already have a, a thought about what it would be like here? And then when you got here, what was it about the U.S. that you thought, oh, I didn't know it would be like this, or, oh, yeah, this is exactly the way I thought it would be in America? Uh, I would I guess personal relationships was the first culture shock. Uh, in the Soviet Union and in Russia, especially in the countryside, you are very close with your neighbors, because if you are in a village that's cut off from the rest of the world after the first snowfall, then your survival depends on you know, good relationships with others. Mm -hmm. Also, when I was growing up, the Soviet Union collapsed and economically, these were challenging times. But what was amazing that nobody was starving, nobody was hungry because there was a lot of exchange with no money involved. So if mm -hmm. I'm a beekeeper and I have a surplus of honey, I would give my neighbors jars of honey with no strings attached. I don't get any payment and I don't really expect a trade. I just give them what I have uh, a surplus of. Mm -hmm. And uh, if somebody is growing apples and they have a bumper crop, they will bring me, actually this happened when we lived in that village, they would bring you a 50 pound uh, bag of apples without expecting or requiring any payment. Mm -hmm. And there was so much of this exchange. If my uncle had uh, potatoes to share and my family lived in the city and couldn't produce potatoes, then we would come and help him dig the potatoes and get some potatoes uh, as a staple for the winter to store. Mm -hmm. So with all of this amazing exchange, everybody had everything. Milk, mm -hmm. dairy, eggs, honey, vegetables, fruit not because you were producing everything yourself, but because there was so much of this informal exchange happening in the countryside, mm -hmm. but also between the families are living in the countryside and the relatives who already moved into the cities. Hmm. Also, if you need something done, it was done together as a community. If somebody is building a house, back then the machinery was just not available there to raise all of these heavy logs to build a log cabin but the strong men like from the village would go into the forest and they would haul the logs from the forest and then they would be building this log cabin together so coming to america one of the first uh, shocks was that people didn't need each other to survive <laughs> mm. there it was very tightly knit but it was coming out of necessity Mm -hmm. uh, and there, after many, many generations of having to have good relationships with neighbors, this became part of the overall culture, um, mm. being very close with your neighbors. And spontaneously, again, you know, there is no economic calculus. If you want to see a friend, you don't have to give them a call and say, I'm coming. You just show up. Mm. This is something I miss here. I only have one friend that can show up unannounced, something that I love. Others feel they need to send an email or call before they show up. So this spontaneity in human relationship is something I was missing. And another one that I mentioned, in the Russian culture, there was a lot of this understanding that the staples that nature provides are to us for free, the food that we get from our fields and from the forest and fish in the, uh, in the lakes or in the rivers, if you get a surplus of it, you would first share it for free with those who need that. Mm -hmm. And here it was very different to the point when I saw a small child at one of the Mizu field days on the farm. Um, they had the corn grinder and children could see where food is really coming from. 
and they were explaining to city kids how food is being produced. So there was dry corn and the manual corn grinder. Um, you turn the handle and you put the corn in and the corn meal comes from the bottom. So there was like a six or seven year old child who was playing in this corn grinder and grinding and grinding it. And then there was a big bag of corn meal that he ground and children could take this corn meal with them to make some corn bread at home. So the person in charge of this exhibit at this field day at Mizu said, you know, great job. Now, what are you going to do with, with all of this corn meal when you go home? The six-year-old child thought about it for a second and said, huh, now I can go ahead and sell it. Mm -hmm. And when I heard it, I thought, gosh, back in these villages where people are very poor and have nothing, mm -hmm. if they had a bag of corn meal that they didn't need, they would give it to the neighbor at no cost. Mm -hmm. The same with meat, dairy, eggs, honey, anything else. But here, a six-year-old child knows that if you have something, that you don't want to use yourself, you can always sell it. And I'm not saying it. there's something wrong about it, but mm. it's like a different universe. Um, amazingly, some of the parts of the world where I've been to, some of the countries that would be considered really poor because people don't have much money or many possessions and belongings, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've noticed that people tend to be much happier. <laughs> Yeah, in exactly these societies, they don't have mortgage bills to worry about. They're relaxed. They don't have things, but they're happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, what you described back home, uh, it wasn't the barter system because it was just sharing a surplus. It wasn't even getting ex an exchange, as you said, because even others would think, well, if I give you this, you give me that. And now it's hoarding things until you can get the right amount of something else you want in exchange. Where in, instead, if you're just handing out the surplus, that is a whole different mindset. And the other thing you mentioned there, too, is because I've been in other countries where the kids were very poor and were building houses and things. And uh, But if you see how happy the kids are running around, they're playing, they're having a good time. And some people went out of their way to kind of explain to them that you don't have a good you know, standard of living. You're poor. You know, they, they were like... <laughs> You know, the kids didn't know. It's like, are you trying to ruin this kid's life? They're happy. They don't know it. They this If you ask them their favorite thing, it's a bag of beans. So that it's it's we have a different mindset because we have surpluses of everything. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, way. Yeah, of yeah Brad, you may remember the time when our, back in the 1990s, 90s, the United States are uh, sending food aid to Russia. Mm. And the irony of it was that uh, they measured uh, the income, the monetary income of people in Russia at the time. And these were very tough times. And they saw that there was not enough money in people's uh, pockets to buy enough food. So they didn't want the country with nuclear weapons to become politically unstable because of starvation and famine. And they were sending food aid to Russia. But the irony was that later, it was realized that when you look at all of this free exchange that flies under the radar because the food is not being bought and sold or not even bartered. Right. During that time when America was sending wheat and other stables to Russia, Russia was actually more food secure than any country in Europe. Because everybody was well fed from all of these uh, family gardens and small subsistence plots and mm -hmm. all of the sharing that followed. Wow, that is interesting. That's all interesting stuff. Okay, so we're going to move on to other things, I think. Uh, I want to talk about the lamb's hives that you sell. I bought the best one that you have. So it's insulated with lamb's wool. Um, so one thing, I had a question about sourcing the, the lamb's wool, the sheep's wool. Is that surplus like that they wouldn't be using otherwise? Are you... What's the quality of it? And like, how do you obtain it? And how do you choose that for the insulation? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, if you open the very old books on beekeeping, including the ones that were published in this country in the 19th century, all mm -hmm. of these grandfathers of American beekeeping like Langstroth and AI Root have uh, a lot to say about the importance of insulation uh, for the winter. 
mm -hmm. and for the hot summer too, and to save the bees from the fluctuations of temperature in the springtime. So the importance of insulation in the beehive was very well understood even 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Lane's hives that uh, I started building based on uh, the blueprints and descriptions and keeping bees in horizontal hives mm -hmm. uh, called for straw insulation. Mm -hmm. But straw insulation is not as practical because you make mats and you attach them uh, with ropes to the outside of the hive and then uh, it gets degraded by the weather and you're supposed to replace these uh, straw mats regularly. Mm -hmm. However, in this old book, so they tell you that uh, one of the best insulators for beehives was uh, uh, fleece, sheep wool. Mm -hmm. And what it made it exceptional is that first, of course, it's excellent insulation. And back then people were using it for insulating their homes too. The very reason hmm. uh, uh, we have that brand that's called rock wool, it's called rock wool is because this is a synthetic uh, replica of the material that ver people were using back then in the 19th century to insulate their homes, which was natural wool. So what makes wool great is that it's very good insulation. Then it has very high permeability uh, ratio. That means moisture from the beehives can go through the walls and get evaporated on the outside of the box. And then finally, and like many other uh, kinds of insulation, sheep wool still retains very good insulating properties, even if it is moist. Mm -hmm. So if there is a lot of moisture migrating through the walls in winter and the uh, wool were to, to become slightly moist, it would still provide good insulation. Mm -hmm. So knowing that it would be the best insulation, I was trying to find wool and finally realized that most of the local farmers who raise sheep for meat production, they're not producing the kind of the wool that's valuable for spinning and making yarn. Um, so they were just making big piles of it and burning it in bonfires in the spring. Mm -hmm. okay. So when I first approached a neighbor farmer saying, can I have you know, some wool? They were ready to give it to me at no cost. But then I exhausted this source. And once we started making hives for sale, I needed more. So I connected with Amish farmers uh, throughout Missouri, and that's where I get my wool now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they were not discarding their wool, but the price they are usually being paid is so small, it's just enough to uh, cover the cost of sharing. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer in fair trade. I feel that fair trade is not just something with the third world. Mm -hmm. Farmers and producers of agricultural products need to be better remunerated here. Mm -hmm. So I pay my suppliers of wool, um, the Amish families, uh, twice as much as the market uh, rate goes mm -hmm. to support them and also to make the wonderful use of this uh, uh, resource that's otherwise either discarded or packed in big containers and uh, sent over uh, to China. Unfortunately, there is little processing of a raw wool in this country. Mm -hmm. All of these buyers that buy up wool throughout the Midwest usually send it over to China, where they still use it mm -hmm. for making fabric and making other products. And actually, the processed wool from China, much of it ends up coming back to the United States, even though this is the originally the Midwest wool from Midwest farmers. Mm -hmm. So that's where I get my wool. And they're... It doesn't have to be washed. It's just this raw wool that's taken off the animals. It may have small amounts of uh, hay or impurities there, but it does not matter. If anything, the unwashed wool will do better as insulation for your beehives because it's coated in lanolin, the grease mm -hmm. that she produced, and it prevents her uh, moth damage and mm -hmm. also makes wool more uh, moisture proof. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, after having a hive like this one out in the bee yard for seven years, this one is insulated with one and a half inches of natural wool. Mm -hmm. Just as part of my quality control, I took off the front wall after seven years to see whether it was still there, whether any insects moved into the wall, whether it was sagging, 
And I was very pleased to see that all of that wool there was exactly the way I had packed it seven years previous. Uh, there was no sagging. There was no mold. There was no insect infestation. After mm -hmm. seven years, it was still this wonderful, wonderful natural material that I put in. And by the way, a hive that's insulated with 1.5 inches of natural wool mm -hmm. has six times more insulation value than conventional uh, uh, thin walled solid wood hives. Mm -hmm. So what would the R value of that wall be? Uh, the R value, including the two skins of formaldehyde free plywood mm -hmm. would be our R6. R6. Yeah. And the R value of our three quarter inch wood uh, high would be around one. Hmm. That's right. And, you know, the whole value of the product that you were just talking about, because that takes us back to the dairy farmers here, you know, they get 50 cents for a gallon of milk. Yeah. And I don't understand how it gets marked up to $5 and something between the farmer and the shelf in the store. I don't understand that at all. And you know the economics of it, but you know, there were times when they were protesting and they were just dumping their milk down the drain because what it costs to produce it and what they're being paid is so far apart. But yeah, and uh, that's you know why there is so much promise in marketing your products direct to customer. For example, I'm right. able to sell my honey so expensively uh, because I sell through my website direct to people who want my honey. So there are no middlemen involved. Mm -hmm. And I know the same is starting to happen with many other agricultural products, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, it's true that, you know, now that the farms are so big, farmers sometimes have no time or even skills to direct market their product. So right. they rely on maximizing quantity. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, in sustainable agriculture, including natural beekeeping, the greatest promise for the future is maximizing quality. Mm -hmm. Because when you try to maximize production of grain, honey, milk, whatsoever, mm -hmm. many times it requires additional inputs. And then at the end of the day, yes, you produce more honey or more milk or more grain, mm -hmm. but you are financially not better off than concentrating, uh, concentrating on making very high value product and mm -hmm. producing just what nature can naturally supply. Mm -hmm. When I was presenting in Kansas at one of the conferences there, there was a, an old farmer who listened to my talk and he said that when he was a boy, all of the farms were 10 times smaller than today. Mm -hmm. And his question was, does it mean that today Kansas farmers are 10 times wealthier or have 10 times as much profit as our 50 years ago? And his mm -hmm. answer was no, because mm -hmm. now that your farm is so great, uh, huge, you need mm -hmm. to invest into million dollar machinery mm -hmm. and uh, seeds and fertilizers and mm -hmm. pesticide and on and on and on and labor. And at the end of the day, uh, like what you describe, or, you know, you make 50 cents or per, per pound or, or per gallon mm -hmm. uh, on your milk, but somebody else is doing, is making twice as much. Right. Yeah. It's corporate farming. Yeah. Yeah. The system, the bigger it is, yeah, the more efficient, the less profit per unit. So that's really interesting. Let's go on to what's your, okay. So when I talk to people about horizontal hives and we look at the layers hive in particular and the way the frames are and they all come together and people are always like, well, then how do I put supplemental feed on that? How do I give them sugar syrup? And my response is always, well, Dr. Leo says you shouldn't be feeding your bees because if you set it up right, you're in the right area, they're self-sustaining. So could you explain a little bit about why, you know, supplemental feeding or the way it's configured, how the hive is supposed to function without meddling with essential oils and syrups and things like that? Yes, uh, thank you, Fred, for the question, but I need to emphasize that there is this big if. Uh, running your bees with no sugar feeding will work if and only if you are working with locally adapted strains of bees that are here in the environment, they're adapted to the length of the local winter, mm -hmm. they're adapted to the pattern of blooming of local plants so they can build up brood on time, 
They can shut down excessive brood production on time in anticipation of the dearth in the summer. Mm -hmm. So if you take bees that are arriving just in the packager with a queen that's not locally adapted and the genetic encoding of the timing of blooming of local plants is just not part mm -hmm. of these colonies or a genetic heritage, then you cannot really uh, hope to be successful uh, without having to feed them our sugar syrup. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, the old book on be the books on beekeeping, including keeping bees in horizontal hives, and the ones written in this country back in the 19th century, when people mm -hmm. out of necessity only used locally adapted bees. There was still no FedEx overnight to deliver you packages of bees or from elsewhere or mm -hmm. queens from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you read in the history of American beekeeping, um, the propagation of Italian queens are started uh, in the later um, 1800s, Langstroth and Root and others uh, were participating and they were experimenting with sending packages by railroad and then sending queens by railroad. But initially, mm -hmm. uh, while everybody had locally adapted queens, uh, uh, no feeding was necessary. Actually, all of these old books that come from the time when there was no non-local bees, they pretty much didn't have any chapter on feeding. And if they had, then uh, the conclusions of the authors were, you don't need to really feed your bees. Also, talking about honey versus sugar. Uh, if you open our Doolittle's our, uh, great book, uh, Management mm -hmm. of Out Apiaries, you will read that his policy was to feed his bees in the spring, to stimulate the buildup in the spring, but not with sugar syrup. He was saving 20 pounds of capped honey in comb per, cap per colony. And in the spring, he was just dropping frames with their uh, capped honey uh, in the colonies as a form of supplemental feeding for increased brood production. Mm -hmm. So everything starts with locally adapted bees. And if you mm -hmm. have locally adapted bees that come from a bee tree in the woods, then it's plain obvious that they've been uh, surviving there for many years and actually many generations mm -hmm. without treatments against the varroa mites and without being fed sugar water. Mm -hmm. So if you start with this kind of genetics and you catch a swarm in the wild more than three miles away from any nearest beekeeper, this is how you really know that the bees are coming from the wild and not mm -hmm. from somebody else's hive. Mm -hmm. And you put them in a hive you can re count on them not requiring feeding. So part of it that you work with local genetics. And the second part of it that is that you do not take from the bees during honey harvest more than what is the real surplus that they do not have a use themselves during the winter. Mm -hmm. It's very common for, be for beekeepers to take more honey and feed bees or sugar syrup instead. Mm -hmm. And it makes economic sense because you can sell your locally produced local honey, maybe on the farmer's market at $10 a pound, and you can buy sugar syrup or even organic sugar at 50 cents a pound wholesale. Um, so taking more honey from the bees and replacing it with sugar syrup is economically the kind of temptation that many people cannot resist. But uh, in my beekeeping, which first started with the desire of providing my children with the highest quality uh, food, um, because it was done for the family and I was not counting on it becoming the major occupation for me. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning, I knew I was not going to feed my bees sugar syrup as a matter of principle. Mm -hmm. And it worked well with these two ingredients. All my bees come from swarms that I caught in the wilderness, far away from any known beekeeper. Mm -hmm. So they're very self-reliant, very robust. And I only take as much in the fall as I see they have the surplus, which means in some years it will be very little. In other years, it will be more. But even in the years when uh, the harvest is very small, I would rather leave the bees uh, all they need for the winter 
mm -hmm. and actually for the spring build up too, uh, instead of taking more from them. So if I were to feed my bee sugar, not only I wouldn't be able to get the same kind of price for my honey that I can, mm -hmm. but also I don't think they would stay as healthy as they are because even with uh, supplements and protein supplements and other artificial foods, mm -hmm. uh, there is no denying that uh, natural honey and natural bee bread and pollen must be bees' ideal food. Mm -hmm. So just as food has tremendous influence on our human health, of mm -hmm. course it has tremendous influence on uh, bees' health. So part of uh, uh, the refusal to feed your bees sugar syrup is uh, also caring for their health with the understanding that we cannot invent bee nutrition that would be superior to what this colony would collect themselves. There are some exceptions, especially today when the diversity of forage where you live may not be ideal for bees wintering. Of course, mm -hmm. they don't winter, say, on honeydew honey as well as on our high quality spring honey from the flowers, etc. But with a few exceptions, uh, the food that they collect will be superior to any supplements or sugar syrup you can give them. So it's my part of my beekeeping approach. Um, I'm not saying that's the only right way of keeping bees. I know there are many constraints and many beekeepers have to feed their bees their uh, mm. sugar syrup, especially if you work with the commercial strains of bees. Mm -hmm. But for me and others who come to my beekeeping classes, I get this point across, you have a choice. So when you read in a book on beekeeping that you need to feed your bees sugar, just to realize that this advice only appeared once people started using non-local strains of bees. Mm -hmm. As long as people were using locally adapted bees, uh, feeding was uh, optional. And even mm -hmm. for those who were feeding their bees, they relied on stockpiling some capped honey as a reserve and giving it back to the bees as necessary. Mm -hmm. So uh, George de Leans in Keeping Bees with a Smile had that policy. He was saying for every hive that you have, you need to have on hand a reserve of at least one full capped frame, but preferably two, mm -hmm. which would mean something between eight and 15 pounds of capped honey per colony to feed them in case there is a crop failure that year, or if you want to speed up brood production in the spring. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to emphasize it because you know, I, I spoke at Mother Earth News Fair in Belton, Texas one year in February, and one lady talk, uh, listened to my talk and was impressed with me saying that I never feed my bees sugar syrup. Mm -hmm. So she went home with her seven colonies that are just regular Italian commercial bees in Langstroth mm -hmm. hives uh, that are dependent on regular feeding. And she pulled their feeders from her hives early in the spring mm -hmm. and all of them starved to death so she wrote me an email one month later when all the colonies died unfortunately it was too, too late to do something mm -hmm. but i want to emphasize that natural beekeeping is a, a holistic system uh, where sometimes you cannot take just one element of the system like refusing to feed you bee sugar Mm -hmm. If you don't have other elements like the survival stock bees you are working with mm -hmm. or having a policy of having enough kept uh, uh, calm in the reserve, mm -hmm. then uh, the, the results can be disastrous. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad we addressed that um, because you also mentioned you might be in a sweet spot where you're three miles uh, from other apiaries. That's very rare for a lot of beekeepers uh, to be that insulated from other influences, other genetics. And it's uh, true, but also yeah. Fred, you know, so many people are tired of uh, uh, buying all of these packages and mm -hmm. queens and many of them failing, not in the first mm -hmm. year, but even during the summer. Mm -hmm. Look, by time it's June, so many people who order packages in April, two mm -hmm. months later, many of, of them are looking for queens. They're asking me mm -hmm. whether I have any surplus mm -hmm. queens because the one they got in the package maybe was damaged during transit and mm -hmm. two months later, they're not finding any brood or any queen. Um, uh, so because our, for a hobby beekeeper who wants to have a few hives and wants them to be self-sustaining, I think uh, 
they would rather prefer to have the kind of the colony that can care for itself and requires less maintenance and res less medication and less feeding and less management, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the beekeepers who surround you are a hobby and small scale beekeepers, they are the ones who would be interested in having local resilient stock. Mm -hmm. So if you cannot be as, as isolated as I am to mm -hmm. catch your swarms, that means you just need to convert other beekeepers into your faith. <laughs> yeah, you need to make friends with them for starters. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you have a dialogue. But uh, that's great. And, you know, it won't be actually, you know, I want people to realize just why many commercial beekeepers are not interested in the local strain of bees. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because they have different constraints. For example, if they're in the business of producing packaged bees, they want to have the bee that produces a lot of brood mm -hmm. because this is what will produce the excess bees they can sell as packages. Mm -hmm. And that's why maybe give preference uh, to Italian bees or Carniolan, mm -hmm. but especially Italians, because they will pr be producing a lot of brood. Right. So a commercial beekeeper who needs to produce hives with a lot of brood production would mm -hmm. not be interested in the, say, locally adapted northern strain of bees, mm -hmm. because I can tell you from my experience that these bees are very conservative with producing brood. In the mm -hmm. spring, and also they shut down brood production much earlier in the fall than the southern bees that people buy from uh, Georgia, Florida, or California, or Hawaii. Yeah, that's absolutely spot on because uh, early on when I was starting with different, different bee strains, the Italians went into winter with such huge brood uh, that their demands for hunting resources were just peaked all through the winter. And uh, again, they started, they kept their brood uh, pattern large and they were you know, mid-December, they already had what would be a spring uh, brood pattern, and they starve themselves out unless you massively supplement those colonies. You're exactly right on that. And, and Fred, uh, may I make a comment here? Just because these bees, an Italian honey bee is number one best-selling uh, bee in America, mm -hmm. but there is also this connection. The more brood you have in the colony, the more food you create for the varroa mites. Yeah. So I'm sure. saying that part of the reason probably that, uh, that I am very successful not treating my bees are against the varroa mites mm -hmm. and them having very high survival rates. First, they come from the woods where treatments are non options. So they're the survival stock that mm -hmm. develop natural defenses. Mm -hmm. But another thing I'm seeing is that the amount of brood they produce is very small compared to the conventional Italian mm -hmm. bee which uh, limits the amount of resource that the raw mites have for their own reproduction. Yep, absolutely. And uh, another thing I'd like to mention is with the Lands Hive, I also bought the wax foundation that you sell, which comes from, is it France or Spain? It comes uh, from the mountains of Spain and I actually have a package here. Yeah. And now for those of your listeners who uh, do not know what the Lands frame is, so, mm -hmm. This is this, it's 12 wide by 16 deep. Mm -hmm. And their uh, American standard deep frame invented by Langstroth is 19 inches by nine. nine. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you read in the history, in the 19th century in Europe, when they were designing the frames and they were asking themselves, what should be the dimension of the frame? They went into the woods and they were measuring the nests of wild bees are living in the woods in tree hollows. Mm -hmm. And what they were seeing is that the uh, width of the honeycomb in the tree hollow would often be between 10 and 14 inches wide mm -hmm. and very, very deep, which is beneficial for bees of wintering in cold mm -hmm. climates. So many of the traditional European frames designed in the 19th century in Europe, they were built around honeybee biology with the frame being 10, 12, or 14 inches wide. Mm -hmm. And they're anywhere from 12 to 18 inches deep. Mm -hmm. So in addition to making frames to the size that would be uh, more consistent with bee biology, um, I use foundation that comes from the regions in Spain where bees do not forage on agricultural crops. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, this is mountain beekeeping, it's wilderness beekeeping. So bees are not exposed to the uh, agricultural chemicals that they would inevitably pick up and you will find it in wax mm -hmm. if your bees are forag foraging on agricultural crops. Mm -hmm. And there, um, beekeepers in that part of Spain use relatively few varro treatments. Um, they treat, but and they give preference to the treatments that leave no residue in mm -hmm. wax, mm -hmm. um, including oxalic acids. Or many of them rely actually on uh, uh, breaking the brood cycle as the form of chemical-free mm -hmm. bromide control. Anyway, so for this reason, they are able to use even the brood comb, just melting it down and using this wax for uh, producing uh, foundation. And I want to show it to your viewers because this is uh, not the kind of foundation we are accustomed to in this country. So I buy it from Spain because of its purity mm -hmm. and, and also because it's built, uh, it's made from uh, the brood palm. It's very aromatic. It has this darker yellow color Mm -hmm. And it smells wonderful. It has the uh, very rich smell of uh, brood comb beeswax. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is wonderful in your swamp traps too, because research showed that uh, the smell of brood comb and brood mm -hmm. comb wax as an additional attractant for swarms. Mm -hmm. And this is very readily accepted by the bees. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I like about the Spanish foundation is that it is 40% thicker it than is. conventional foundation found yeah. here. That's the first thing you notice when you take it out of the out of the box is how thick that stuff is. Yeah. And you're right about the smell and I didn't realize it was composed of brood comb. So that would, in some respects, make it stronger, wouldn't it? Oh, it would because yeah. we know that the wax are uh, used in brood comb construction or in any comb construction contains mm -hmm. propolis too. And that's one of the reasons why there is this very aromatic smell to this foundation. Mm -hmm. And propolis is a natural antibiotic. So it's great to have it in your foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and also it makes it stronger. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I'm glad we brought that up too. So there was another thing that you wrote about, or maybe it was in the book, um, but it was about the cluster in winter and how they move up the frames. And I think it was cited that they move a millimeter a day. Is of that course, right? it will depend on temperature and conditions, but our, yeah, that's coming from keeping bees with a smile. Yeah, okay. Exciting research that was done in Northern Europe and Russia, mm -hmm. uh, where they were uh, calculating that on average, it's one millimeter a day. That means our uh, one inch in a month, basically. Mm -hmm. Have you and found that? Have you found that to be pretty accurate where you are there, or have you even paid attention to that? And no, back then I was not paying attention to okay. that. But I can tell you that it's true that very many beekeepers in uh, Russia are using the brood frames that are twelve inches deep. Mm -hmm. Here it was called the Jumbo Dadan standard, mm -hmm. uh, and there. The old books are all tell you that uh, these additional two inches or three inches compared to the nine inch Langstroth frame mm -hmm. um, are conducive to better overwintering. And it makes sense because once uh, the bees have all of that honey above them and they can access honey mm -hmm. without that gap between the boxes, mm -hmm. um, uh, the honey is uh, immediately available to them at all times and starvation becomes less of a, of a possibility. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Does the state of Missouri require you to register hives and get inspected? Does the Department of Agriculture come and look in on you there? No, uh, there is no such requirement. And actually, it's uh, the, the agri apiculture laws are so conservative that, for example, it even says that the bee inspector can only come to your bee yard and look at your hives, sir, uh, without your permission, if they have grounds to believe that your beehives are spreading an infectious disease. Mm -hmm. At all other instances, they need to have your permission to even open your hives or come mm -hmm. to your land. Mm -hmm. So for example, 
if there is foul brood in your district and your neighbors are complaining of foul brood suddenly appearing in their hives, mm -hmm. there will be a concern and suspicion that your hives may have foul brood too, in mm -hmm. which case the inspector can come and have your hives inspected whether you want it or not. In all other instances, they can come and ask permission. Uh, but if you say no, they wouldn't even have a valid their legal reason to insist mm -hmm. on visiting your bees and opening your hives. I can tell you that uh, in all the years of keeping bees here, because we are not required to register our bees, mm -hmm. uh, I never was approached by the bee inspector with any mm -hmm. questions or with any, uh, mm, like, no bee inspector ever said they wanted to inspect my hives. Mm -hmm. And this would be pretty much the norm. If you have a question or concern, you can always call them mm -hmm. and schedule a visit. But unless there is some outbreak of American fall brood, or probably very rarely any of the bee inspectors would be just going out and inspecting people's hives. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I like that policy. And do you collaborate with any other beekeepers where you are? You're pretty much on your own there. I'm pretty much on your own because, you know, I, uh, I don't go to beekeeping meetings because so much of the discussion there is about buying packages from Georgia and what chemical to use in your hives mm -hmm. and uh, when to feed them sugar water. It's just not relevant to the kind of beekeeping I am doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the other thing is that distances here are pretty substantial. For example, to give this interview to you, I had to drive one hour to where there is high speed internet because where we live there is just no high in speed internet options at all what uh, yeah well we have the satellite dish at home but it yeah. is weather dependent so if it right. starts raining the connection yeah. is very poor yeah. and then there is the time lag so i wanted you to have a high quality recording so i drove one hour into town to where we have high speed internet wow and uh, so going to a beekeeping meeting would mean, would mean for me is there are two hours of driving, one hour, one way. Um, and there, there are very few beekeepers around me because the Ozarks is a wonderful place to keep your bees in terms of the diversity of forage, but mm. not in terms of the quantity of forage. So mm. those who want to maximize their honey production, they tend to take their bees somewhere where um, it's more agricultural landscape so that there is alpha alpha and clover and other major agricultural honey producing plants around. Mm -hmm. Here I rely entirely on wilderness plants and there, these wilderness plants may fail in some years because of the weather part. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this part of the Ozarks where I am uh, is not really very attractive to uh, most beekeepers mm -hmm. who prefer to put their uh, bees on agricultural crops to maximize honey production. Mm -hmm. Well, you've described a really good area to be. I think everyone should move there right now. So uh, I think so too. <laughs> and I appreciate no, but it's challenging too. You know, people just don't realize it's not life in paradise. Yeah. You have uh, like, if you go into the woods, you will have 100 ticks on you. If you need to have a dental appointment, the nearest dentist who is not going to destroy your mouth is probably a two hour drive <laughs> one way. And I'm serious. All of, all, we, we, all, we tried going to a local dentist and like they broke my child's tooth when during cleaning and they forget about it. So now instead of going 45 minutes into nearest little town, uh, we have to take our children for dental care and ourselves into Springfield, which is a two hour drive away. Uh, the nearest hospital is uh, one hour, 20 minutes away, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The nearest grocery store is 50 minutes away by car. So it's really remote. Okay. For those who like being remote without having to move to Alaska, that's a very good place to be. Uh, but uh, I mentioned that, you know, you will be surrounded and not just by beautiful, pristine nature. If anything, right now, we'll be surrounded by the sound of bulldozers raising forests down. Okay, you've, you've convinced me. I'll stay where I am. <laughs> so, 
And the other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, you sell art panels for some of the sides of your horizontal hives. Are those uh, original artworks? Is that by, who paints those? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, these art panels are made by my family. The ones that you see on horizontalhive.com are made by my wife, Irina, and my daughter, Lada. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is how we started uh, offering them. Uh, almost all our beehives are in the apiary are painted with uh, fancy designs. Mm -hmm. But if you paint directly on the hive box, uh, when it's exposed to the sun and to the weather, eventually even exterior grade paint starts peeling and fading. And uh, I felt very sorry for some of these very beautiful designs eventually disappearing mm -hmm. after exposure to weather for eight or 10 years. So when the time came to renew these designs, I told my family that I thought this uh, artwork was so beautiful that uh, we should uh, make the painting on uh, paper and scan it so that we can then print it on our aluminum panels uh, using exterior grade mm -hmm. uh, ink that's used for outdoor signs and such. Mm -hmm. And this way, we now decorate all of our hive boxes with these beautiful printed panels that we can replace after 10 years when the, mm -hmm. uh, when the paints start fading. Mm -hmm. And also for those who would like to buy a ready-made panel mm -hmm. with the painting, we can print additional copies for sale. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I didn't realize they were on aluminum. So, well, I'm glad we addressed that. And do you have any hidden talents of your own that nobody knows about? Perhaps. Well, but, <laughs> do, you, do you play an instrument? Do you yodel? Is there, what skill do you have that people would be surprised? No, you know, I think the hidden, uh, well, only my family knows. Or I think a hidden talent I have is that I'm a trained midwife. And uh, I assisted to the home birth of my own children with no other midwife present. I, I guess it should be called mid husband, not midwife. But for me, it was a very important part of our life experience to be yeah. fully responsible, not only for the conception of the child, but for the uh, birth of the child. Uh, so when we were expecting our baby, I went through this training and apprenticeship with the midwife so that I can do it in the family, so we can do it completely on our own. And that's what you actually did? You delivered your own children? Yes, five I'm, of them. I am impressed, Dr. Leo. I am impressed, and I did not know that. <laughs> okay, so... Um, oh, yeah. I should say that, you know, that's something that most males are capable of. That's not that complicated. If you allow yeah. nature to take its course, it's similar to natural beekeeping. If you take the bees that can survive in the wild, and that's what you do to them in your managed beehives, there is no reason for them to get sick and die. If your wife or your woman, the mother of your child is healthy, and they're if there are no complications in nature, natural birth happens are peacefully and successfully on its own most of the time. You mm -hmm. know, when I was being trained as a midwife, I read this wonderful book written by an MD um, that's called Emergency Childbirth. That's for firefighters and police officers, anyone mm -hmm. uh, who can sometimes have to, uh, to attend to a birth. And the message in this book was, if you ever assist to childbirth, your number one task is not to stand in nature's way because without your involvement, most of the time, nature will deliver babies just fine. And again, the same I'm seeing with the honeybees. Like this winter, my survival rate was 90%. It's mm -hmm. so only one out of 10 colonies perished. Mm -hmm. And there, it's completely on its own. I don't take credit for it. Mm -hmm. Just with, as with natural home childbirth, I feel that the greatest challenge for natural beekeeping is uh, to realize we need to get out of the way and not stand in nature's way mm -hmm. of uh, natural beekeeping working on its own. And I know just why it's so difficult is because if you see one of your hives is uh, dying or could mm -hmm. be saved with a varroa treatment or with antibiotic from Falbrood, etc. It's tempting to use the silver bullet 
and fix the issue there with the technology we have. Mm -hmm. But natural beekeeping involves just that, natural selection. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you see that, yes, this colony could be saved with antibiotics, but you are not saving it. Or if anything, you would there requeen them with a queen that has better resistance to disease, mm -hmm. but are not standing in nature's way is part of a natural beekeeping approach, which mm -hmm. sometimes means allowing natural selection to take its course. That means the death of some colonies that in the big picture of things, it also means that the overall genetics and their uh, sustainability of your beekeeping operation mm -hmm. keeps improving every year. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the way most beekeepers want to be keeping their bees. It's the path they want to take. Nobody wants to be constantly educating themselves about the latest treatment and whether or not it leaves a residue and whether or not it can be done with supers on or supers off and all the other things going on. Uh, the long game is going to be the genetics of the bees and the bees' ability to survive. So I think you've said that very well, by the way. And uh, I'm really glad that you talked with me today, Dr. Leo. And I think there's a lot of good information for people to think about and they'll follow the links and so on. But do you have a closing statement for backyard beekeepers, something that you haven't covered already that you wanna share, or do you think we're done? Uh, one thing I wanted to share is that for me, even though I enjoy beekeeping tremendously, it was never just about producing honey or even livelihood and income. I really wanted beekeeping to be keeping bees with a smile and something that I would enjoy doing and something that uh, I could do together with my children as a family. And I feel that the natural approach and using horizontal hives that require no heavy lifting makes it pro uh, accessible to all. So for example, part of the reason why I never take uh, um, varomite counts, because this would not put a smile on my face. I don't want to be like counting these or drowning 300 bees in alcohol. It would just not be pleasurable. And I thought, yeah, I want to create the kind of beekeeping that would be pleasurable, healthy, and something that uh, I can do with the family and their horizontal hives and this natural approach fills the bill. Mm -hmm. So if you are striving to have uh, a sustainable operation, um, even on a very small scale, I encourage you to ask this question whenever you are doing something to your bees. Is this something I enjoy doing? Mm -hmm. And if the answer, say with some of the treatments and other things is no, you feel that you don't enjoy putting all of these chemicals into the highs, but you are not seeing any other alternative, then it just means that uh, you actually do have a choice. You can continue doing something that you don't enjoy with your bees, but then why do it at all? Or it's actually pushing you towards finding better ways and alternatives that would make it more pleasurable and they're appealing to you. So what I arrived at in beekeeping was always just follow your smile, follow something you're enjoying. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it brought me to this actually not my methods, but to the very old time methods mm -hmm. where the task of the beekeeper was limited to catching a local swarm, giving bees a very good, well-insulated home, not stressing or messing with them too much, mm -hmm. and then opening the hive once a year to take some honey as a sweet reward. Mm -hmm. I thank you all for your attention and I thank you, uh, Fred, for having me on your channel. And I best wishes to all of you keeping these with a smile okay thank you so much that was an excellent closing statement dr leo i appreciate it and so ends another interview with an expert in beekeeping i hope you enjoyed today's information about horizontal hives and keeping bees with a smile as well as the principles and practices of natural beekeeping i'm frederick dunn and i wish you all the best with honeybees in your care I invite you to subscribe so you won't miss a single upcoming episode. Links are in the video description down below. Thanks for watching.